Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the latest Shiny podcast. This is Stephen Spector again with the Rob Hirschfeld. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, Stephen. So, Rob, I know you've uh, returned from Orlando, Florida, everyone's favorite um, uh, destination for vacation, except you didn't go with children. You went to the Gartner yeah. Symposium event. <laughs> Sometimes they act like children. Sometimes they act. Just IT professionals. Yeah, so I'm really I'm interested to learn a little bit more about this event. You know, as uh, someone who comes from open source or more technical, um, this necessarily isn't the kind of event that typically I would go to, and I'm not sure how often you go to these. So I'm really interested in your impression on the event and uh, what you what you found out. I I can summarize it for the people who go to open source uh, tech conferences with I wore a jacket. Uh, <laughs> that that solves a, a lot. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a jacket type of show. These are um, CIOs and executives. Predominantly, there were, there were a couple of, of technical people who were rising into management and CIO roles, and so they had training for that. Um, and it was, it was more for the smaller company. So the, the target audience is not the innovative web tech, um, you know, digital media giants uh, or telecoms. It's much more um, the mid to large enterprise who has a, you know, sort of a, a limited IT budget from a, most of their money goes to keeping the lights on. They outsource a lot of projects. They buy a lot of software. Um, you know, they, they aren't trying to disrupt the market by being innovative um, on how they develop the software. They're, they're, you know, there's, there's sort of one, one step behind where if people listen to me talk, I'm usually, you know, we're usually trying to figure out not just how you do something innovative itself, but how you do it in an innovative way to reduce the costs. You know, technology is the core of your business. Most of these are it's like pharmaceuticals and oil and gas and, um, you know, shipping companies and, and people who use technology is important, but it's not, it's not the thing they sell. But so there, I would imagine the word, a word conservative would make good sense here. Uh, care, conservative, uh, let me frame that, yes, yeah. in, a, in a way. Conservative in that their budget for this year is set. Their budget for next year is, is pretty much set, right? They, they, then the budget for the year after that is a little bit flexible. So they're conservative in that they really can't go out and say, oh, Kubernetes just came on, Docker's here, and we're going to rewrite all our apps to use Docker. They're conservative in that they, they can't do that. They, they've got to sort of work through the process of absorbing the technology that, that, that they've got, and they've got to take you know, careful incremental steps. Um, and so, is Gart so is Gartner there? I guess the way to look at it, maybe I'm thinking is, I don't want to say Gartner's hand-holding them, but Gartner's really showing them where things are now, where things are going, and kind of getting them to start looking where they need to look down the road and Gartner's pre-setting them for that. So that was the aha for me at this, yep. at this conference. And I, I had a lot of great conversations, right? A lot of hallway, you know, talking to somebody on an escalator um, type of, of conversations. And the, the interesting thing is, you know, Gartner's sort of saying, these are the problems you're dealing with today. These are the things that are coming in three years that you need to be thinking about and start opening up some budget to be ahead of that. And that's the, that's the magic thing. And it's really hard. Um, it's why they pay Gartner. It's part of the, the magic. If you think about the magic quadrants, what they're doing is they're, they're measuring what they've got today. And then they need to make um, some strategic bets on what they bring in with their discretionary, with their discretionary budget, or if they, you know, fire the vendors they've got to make room for somebody else. Um, and that's, that's a lot of how the, the people I was talking to were approaching these positions. They, they need to know, um, the, the one that made my head explode uh, during the Gartner keynote was basically, we're not gonna solve the security skills shortage. Oh gosh. Uh, <laughs> it's not getting better, but AI is coming up really fast and there's a lot of interest and in AI might solve the security problem for us because we're not gonna have enough people to solve it. So. Invest more in AI, and you know, don't chase don't, don't chase the security problem. And my head just goes boom. This was Gartner's message to them. 
This was Gartner's keynote message. Wow. Um, and in some ways, they're very right. If you're a, you know, a more stable company, you're not going to compete for those, those limited security professionals coming down the pipe. It's, it's, it's a very pragmatic concern of how am I going to secure my enterprise? It's, you know, and if the answer is hire smart people to do security, that's not going to solve this problem for you. Well, there are not enough of them out there. And that was their point. And so what, what they're right is the trend line says AI analytics of infrastructure and application security doing active monitoring is going to step in to fill the breach and create, um, literally, I guess in this case, um, and, and it's going to create a more enhanced security posture based on AI. Um, but that seems a couple years down the road, at least. It, it, I, was, I was about to put a whole bunch of asterisks yeah. in explanation points because it's not an adequate answer. It's not going to protect your posture. You need to hire those people. And even if you, you know, an AI is going to solve it, you're going to need somebody supervising or making those decisions and things like that. So it's, it, you know, I offer that not as a, Rob thinks this is a great way to solve security, uh -huh. more, more as an understanding of what the Gartner audience is thinking from a, I, need to, I know this is a problem, how am I going to solve it, where am I going to, what, what's that incremental path um, that I'm going to walk? And that, that, from that perspective, it was, it, you know, there was a lot of things like that once I understood that framework. Um, before I understood that framework, it was very confusing. I'm like, well, wait a minute. This show feels like it's stuck in 2014 with three-year-old technologies and, and you know, a lot, of, a lot of sort of moving, you know, not adopting. You know, it wasn't a Kubernetes show and Docker. Those things weren't really discussed. Um, it was a VMware and Microsoft and Java show. And then they threw in machine learning and AIs and, and all this, you know, 20, you know, 2020 type of conversations. And you're like, wait, there's a six year gap in here. Um, and that's why. Uh, so interesting. We'll so what about out. cloud? What was, Important. what was the, I'm curious about, I don't know if the public private cloud discussions happened. Did you get a feel for what these companies are doing? Everything. That's it's so, and, and the Gartner analysts would, would echo the same thing. So the, the idea of having a mono culture and a mono IT culture is um, is dead from that perspective. They recognize and the people recognize that they're playing in multiple environments, doing multiple things, using multiple infrastructures. So the idea of hybrid, which is in some ways people would say multi-cloud, hybrid is important because everybody there also has on-premises uh, components to what they do. And so the idea is that you're hybrid. You're not necessarily um, hybrided head Everybody wants hybrid to mean I'm, you know, dynamically moving workloads yeah. in a portable way across multiple infrastructures. Yay! That's, that, yes, that's what we all want. The reality is, is that we're not dynamically moving infrastructure. We are connecting things together across different infrastructures, and, and Kubernetes makes some portability. Um, but the reality is that people are using a lot of different infrastructures and trying to cope with that. Um, and this wasn't the type of show to go to the tools and say, wow, if you use you know, Terraform or Chef or Ansible or something else, then this solves us. They, they don't make recommendations like that. Um, instead, they're, you know, they're, it's, it's, a, it's sort of a higher level. Um, you know, does, open, does Amazon meet your needs? OpenStack really wasn't, didn't show up at all. With yeah. Us. Um, you know, it's VMware, vCenter solve this problem for you or uh, whatever V universal world peace. <laughs> so I, there was one thing I know we had talked about before the podcast was um, you came out of there with this uh, disruption idea from one of the talks. And uh, I, I thought we'd just cover that to kind of wrap up your thoughts on this event. Can you kind of rehash a little bit what we talked about the other day? I'd love to. Um, Everybody's actually probably familiar with um, the innovators dilemma. Dilemma. Uh, Clayton Christensen wrote this book a, a while ago, talking about how hard it is for incumbents to disrupt themselves. Um, and he gave a talk about that. He has a new book out called "Competing Against Luck," um, sort of refining some of these topics and, and 
try to help people get the, their user's headspace. So both really good books if you haven't read them. Um, and the, the short summary on this is that the disruption that we're going to see next in, in cloud is not going to be by incremental improvements on cloud. So the innovator's dilemma sort of says, if I'm going to you know, disrupt Amazon, I'm not going to be doing it, or VMware, I'm not going to be doing it by making incremental improvements against what VMware offers. So if you want to think about OpenStack from that perspective, then OpenStack was really trying to replicate Amazon and VMware and offer just incremental improvements or price performance. And so those are marginal benefits against entrenched incumbents where the problem space is known, the costs are known. It, it's, you're, not, you're not really disruptive in that sense. You're, you're actually trying not to be disruptive. You're trying to offer efficiency improvements, incremental improvements to, to an existing infrastructure. Uh, the disruption in this market is going to come from somebody who is, you know, actually changing the economics in a way that, that the big people would discount as, ah, who cares? That's not something I would go after. I'm not interested in that market. It's low margin. Um, matter of fact, that exact phrase is one of the key phrases in the examples he was giving. Um, True, you know, one of the, I loved his, these examples because he was talking about the steel in industry and he was talking about rebar uh, specifically as the downfall of the steel industry. Um, and if you haven't, if you don't know, uh, you know, we, we run a project called Digital Rebar. So um, it, it was, uh, every time you say rebar, I, I, I had a little. So little clearly little Digital Rebar is going to bring the downfall of all. The downfall. Awesome. It, it, it's, <laughs> that you, you could draw those links. I'm glad you did. <laughs> um, so, so the idea with is rebar, rebar crushed the steel industry because the people who um, went after the new, the next generation steel manufacturers went after the low margin rebar uh, market, and they, the, the the incumbents said, I don't care about the rebar market. It's low margin, you know, junk steel. Who cares? You can have this part of the market, and then they systematically ate the market from the bottom. And for us, and what we do from a data center market, everybody sort of says, bare metal, who cares, right? I, you know, I don't want to touch metal. It's painful and ugly, and you know, the, the manufacturers don't make any money on it anymore. And when, when I look at that market and what we do, we, we start thinking through, this is probably a whole other podcast, but you, you start saying, well, wait a second, if I had small, cheap servers and I could manage them as easily as we manage vir virtual machines, then that sounds like this you know, rebar market from Steel's perspective. You don't want to, you know, thousands of small little, you know, two or three core machines with, with a couple of gigs of RAM in it don't sound very interesting to a big data center provider or a big, you know, Dell manufacturer like Dell or HP or, mm -hmm. um, but from a power density performance and isolation perspective, they look like virtual machines. If I can manage metal and buy metal as cheaply as it would cost me or cheaper, which is the key thing, much cheaper than it would cost me to manage that same thing, um, then I've disrupted a market. If I'm eliminating virtualization and the cost of virtualization by just running containers on metal or apps directly on metal, then wow, that's a that's a big deal. Um, the thing that that Clayton Christensen, or Dr. Christensen, would would possibly point out is if the incumbents tell you, oh, I don't care about that market. It's a low margin market, right? It's not. It's not. It's not, it's not that capable. It's right. If they're going to dismiss it as not interesting or not cost effective, then that is a market primed for disruption because somebody can come in and, and do that. He gave another good example that I'll, 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 I'll leave in the, we'll, we'll have a whole podcast probably on this yeah, topic. Sure. Um, he compared Tesla. He's like, look, Tesla's an incremental, everybody loves Tesla, right? Great innovative company, but it's an incremental improvement on an automobile. It's not, it's not really making, you know, it's not disrupting automobiles in the way they're manufactured or their costs. Um, it's incremental improvements in efficiency. Um, 
if you look in Japan, in China, China introduced a three thousand dollar car, right? That's one lane. It's half a lane wide. It's this little, basically one seater unit. Wouldn't meet American safety standards, I'm sure. Oh, but, of course. But it's a third the price of any other car on market, and it solves their, you know, it, and it solves their needs, and. It's dominating, and it doubles the traffic capacity yeah, on the so road. It's, it's half, it's half height. Yeah, so they've sold hundreds of thousands of these cars in a year. So you, <laughs> Tesla's making thousands of cars a year. Um, it's it's radically different, and that is disruption. That's where GM says, oh, I don't care about that market. It's the three, th you know, who cares about low margin, bottom end cars? I don't care. Um, you know, they, their eyes are on the, the Teslas who seem to be taking market share from them at the top. Um, and Dr. Christensen's point of view is going to be, that's not where the, that's not what's going to kill your market. The thing that's going to kill your market is the place you don't, you think the margin is too low to compete because they're going to figure it out. So that's it. Well, I think mean, that's good. I think we'll talk more about this because I do think, you know, the digital rebar, the concept of, uh, you know, bare metal and tying it to edge computing and immutable infrastructure. I think there's a broader story here and uh, we'll keep talking. Yeah, that's, that. we're, we're going to have to decompose that and take it piece by piece because there's, I, I ripped through some very significant concepts about speed, performance and cost that, you know, need need some depth to, to justify but it's a start so well i think it's interesting rob your perspective in the gartner event i know um, i've never been to a gartner event i've known they've happened and i've supported them remotely in my career but uh you know i can't say i've been to an event where i had to put a sport jacket on that's just, just <laughs> way it's way too scary for me it, unless i'm in europe and then okay I'll, I'll give in but in america in orlando florida i mean just oh my gosh it's just scary. Well, hopefully they did something nice. At the, you didn't have to do Disney or anything like that when you were there. We did. We did a short stint through Universal, uh, which was nice, um, and that was that was fun. <laughs> no, no Disney. Well, <laughs> Rob, we'll go ahead and close up. Thanks again for uh, your Excellent. thoughts on Steven, the event, and uh, I look forward to more discussions on this disruption uh, idea with Digital Rebar. Thank you. It's coming. Stay tuned. Thanks.